Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, post-operative uh, management. So if you have never gone through the pre-op management, you can just uh, follow the link to my YouTube channel and you'll be able to go through the pre-operative uh, management. But today I'll talk about the post-operative. And when it comes to post-operative, no matter the condition that you have been given, either emergency condition or an elective condition, the post-operative is going to be the same and the points will not change, they're still going to be the same. So as usual, my name is Mr. Urod and uh, from here we can move on to the aims of the post-operative uh, management. So as usual, for any management that you're dealing with, you need to start with the aims. And these aims, you need to have at least four aims for you to get the full marks. So you, we can put aims such as uh, to ensure normal cardiovascular and respiratory function. Apart from that, we can talk about other aims uh, such as um, uh, we can talk about other aims such as to closely monitor the patient for complications such as hemorrhage, to relieve incision or pain, as well as to maintain adequate nutrition. So those are some of the aims that you can have that can apply on any pre uh, on any post of uh, management condition. Then from there, your next heading is going to be patient collection. So on patient collection here, what you say is that uh, once the patient is ready for collection from theater, I'll go to pick the patient with a post-operative tray containing gauze swab for wiping away oral secretions, examination glass for use when handling body fluids from the patient, the oral pharyngeal airway to help in maintaining the tongue in position, the tongue depressor and an emesis for in case of the uh, in case of uh, patient vomiting or airway occlusion by the tongue. You can also continue. You can also add on other points such as um, I will get a detailed handover from the theater nurse about the details of the anesthesia and surgery. Uh, apart from that, you can also get details about the fluid or blood loss as well as the replacement, including analgesics given during surgery and then from there you can also look at other uh, other areas as you collect the patient such as uh, before receiving the handover of the patient i will ensure the patient is breathing by closely um, observing the rising and falling of the chest uh, and then also feeling for warm air from the patient's nostril using the back of the palm so when you go to collect the patient, you don't go with uh, TPR instruments, but you'll just go with the things I've mentioned above. So the only way you would ensure that you're collecting a patient who's still alive and not dead is by checking the rising and falling of the chest, as well as uh, feeling for warm air coming out of the nostrils. Then from there, you can also add on to say, I will transfer the patient to the ward by use of a patient trolley in recumbent position with the head turned to the side to prevent blockage of the air by oral secretions. I will also ensure the patient is well covered to prevent chills. So those are some of the points you can put on patient collection. So after collecting the patient, the next heading is about talking about the environment where you are keeping your patient from. So here you can say in the immediate post-operative period, I will nurse the patient in the acute bay, which is well equipped with emergency drugs and equipment for close monitoring and easy access to emergency care. Apart from that, other points that you can add on, you can say I will ensure uh, that the environment is warm enough to prevent hypothermia since the post-operative patient are prone to hypothermia due to blood loss and exposure to cold in the theater environment. And then you can also add on to say, I will also ensure that there is adequate ventilation to promote free circulation of air. And I will, uh, I will ensure that there's cleanliness to prevent uh, infections. And apart from that, you can also that ensure that the environment is quiet to enable the patient rest from the stress of surgery. So having to looked at those points under the environment, you can now move on to maintaining the air because at this point, the patients are mostly still unconscious. The, the anesthesia has not yet weared off in the patient's blood. So from on maintaining a clear air, you can say I'll nest the patient in recumbent position with the head turned to one side to promote drainage of oral secretions while under the effects of general anesthesia. 
you can also uh, talk about um, uh, ensuring that the head is hyperextended to facilitate free entry of air as well as the expiration. Apart from that, you can just mention to say you maintain uh, nursing the patient in this particular position until when the patient is fully recovers from the, the effects of anesthesia. That's when you prop up the patient or nurse the patient in semi, um, semi prone. Uh, uh, or you prop up the patient, this, and this helps in promoting uh, adequate lung expansion. You can also talk about suctioning excessive uh, oral secretions to prevent aspiration. You can also insert an oropharyngeal airway to prevent the tongue from falling backwards and blocking the air. So those are some of the points that you can put on maintaining airway, then you move on to maintaining adequate breathing. So on maintaining adequate breathing here, you can say I'll assess the adequacy of breathing by checking the patient's respiratory rate, observing for presence of cyanosis and pulse oximetry to determine oxygen saturation. And this will be necessary in determining whether there will be need to administer supplemental oxygen and use mechanical ventilation or endotracheal intubation. You can also administer supplement oxygen via a nasal catheter or oxygen mask if there is cyanosis or if the oxygen saturation levels are below 90%. Then from there you move on to maintaining adequate circulation. So on maintaining adequate circulation here you can say I'll assess uh, adequacy of circulation by doing capillary refill tests checking the skin color and the incision on site for fresh bleeding. I will ensure that the intravenous uh, line is patent for continuous infusion and that fluid is running at correct rate to prevent fluid overload or under hydration. So those points are enough on circulation. You even move on to care of the drainage because uh, patients, they mainly come with drainage tubes. So here we, we are saying care of the drainage tubes. So here, you can say after putting the patient in bed comfortably, I will check in the file for the patient's doctor's uh, order for specific treatment, for example, oxygen, intravenous infusions, apart from that also appropriate drainage system. Then you, uh, also about special positioning and observations that needs to be checked on this particular patient. You can also say our clamp the drainage tubes, because if they are not quick and clamped, they may become blocked or sufficient pressure will build up in the body cavities to cause serious uh, effects such as abdominal distension, which will in turn cause leakage and secretion into the peritoneal cavity if at all the, the incision was made um, on the abdomen. And this may result in peritonitis if you have fluid seeping in the peritoneal cavity. So you need to ensure to talk about all those points in care of the drainage because most of patients will come with certain drainage tubes, especially if you talk of chest injuries, as well as abdominal surgeries, laparotomies, all those you'll find that patient comes with drainage tubes. Then from there, you even move on to observations. So what do you talk about on observation? Here you need to monitor the vital signs such as temperature, pulse, respirations as well as uh, blood pressure and together with the level of consciousness and orientation and also ability to move extremities to monitor the patient's recovery from general anesthesia and detect any complications such as hemorrhage. So you are going to say this will be done every 15 minutes for the first one hour, then every 30 minutes for the next two hours, then progress to hourly for the next two hours. Then if stable, you will do four hours until when the patient fully recovers from the general anesthesia. You can also observe the intravenous line for patterns as an infusion to correct, I mean for correct rate as well as a solution. Apart from that, you can also observe the fluid input and output and record on the fluid balance chart to prevent fluid overload. You can also observe the surgical site and wound, wound, the wound drainage system as well as the urinary catheter for position, patency, 
how are urine output uh, as well as the color and concentration of uh, urine. You can also ensure the drainage bags are hanging properly and the suction machine is functional. If the patient is receiving oxygen, you can also ensure that uh, the application and the flow rate is, co is, is correctly placed as well as ordered. So all those things, you can mention them on the observation. Then from there, you even move on to pain management. So on pain management here, you can say, I'll assess the pain level, pain characteristic, meaning the location as well as the quality of this pain and the timing so that I can know what interventions to put in place. You can also assess the patient for signs of uh, pain such as uh, restlessness, facial expression, as well as guarding. You can also position the patient in the correct position to enhance comfort as well as safety of the incisional wound by preventing pressure against the incisional site. Apart from that, you can now also administer prescribed narcotics uh, such as pethidine, 50 to 100 milligrams, either IM or IV, and this is given between six hourly or eight hourly. But at most, you can give four doses to block pain sensation. Then when the oral intake resumes, you can now administer oral analgesics such as paracetamol. This one, you give 1,000 milligrams eight hours. And you can also provide the quiet environment to enable the patient rest. And you can also use diversion of therapy when the patient regains consciousness to, to, to distract the mind of the patient from the incisional site. Then other non-pharmacological interventions that you can use um, is the diversion of therapy as well as relaxation, imagination, massage, and splinting of the incision are often used in combination with the medication so as to reduce the pain. So all those points, you can add them on pain management. From there, you even move on to psychological care. So on psychological care, you can talk about uh, that once the patient is, is now fully awake, and oriented, you can now explain to the patient what the surgery, what type of surgery was done, and the findings in, in that particular surgical procedure. You can also explain the measures which are put in place to relieve the pain, as well as for prevention of complications such as uh, uh, such as. Um, uh, gain, gaining her cooperation. So when you explain the, the complication of, the, of uh, 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 whatever transferred from the surgery to the patient, you even gain cooperation for the interventions that are going to be done further. You can also explain the significance of all the tubes that the patient comes with from theater to prevent unnecessary anxiety. Apart from that, you can allow the members to visit the patient after uh, completing the initial assessment of the patient to promote uh, emotional support. You can also explain the post-operative expectations such as the need to perform deep breathing, coughing exercises, and early ambulation to gain the patient's uh, cooperation. You can also allow the patient to, expre to express the, uh, their, their fears as well as their concerns about the surgical procedure and the post-operative expectation, and this helps relieve psychological Tension. So all those points, you can mention them on psychological care. And from there, you move on to nutrition and the fluids. So here, what you can talk about is that once the patient now returns from theater with an intravenous line and then as a gastric tube for drainage of gastric content, you can ensure that the patient is new per oral until when bowel sounds are heard or return. And this helps to prevent intestinal obstruction which may result from food bolus. So during this time, the patient will be receiving fluids for nutrition and rehydration parentally. And then apart from that, you need to ensure that you record the intake and output of fluids to prevent overload or underload. And when the bowel sounds now return, you can now give uh, sips of clear fluids such as plain water to assess the return of reflex swallowing. And if they are tolerated, then you can switch on to other foods. So apart from that, you can remove the nasogastric tube to allow the patient to take fluids fr freely. And then apart from that, the diet can now be gradually advanced from liquids to solid foods and then to more solid foods. Then apart from that, you can also ensure that the patient is eating 
uh, a nutritious meal or a nutritious diet which can which is, needs to contain enough uh, carbohydrates for energy adequate proteins to replace tissue adequate vitamins for, for quick wound healing as well as zinc for formation of new epithelial tissue then you can also encourage the patient to drink adequate fluids to prevent dehydration and constipation, which can lead to straining as well as uh, leading to contribute, which can contribute to wound gapping. So all those points can be put on nutrition and fluids. From there, you now move on to wound care, which is important so that you prevent infections. So on wound care, you can talk about um, uh, so here the main objective of wound care is, is to have the wound remain firm and uninfected and to heal with minimum scar tissue. So in the immediate post-operative period, you need to, to inspect the wound for bleeding, its tightness, uh, the tightness of the bandage and the nature of drainage and amount from the drain tube. If there is fresh blood, you need to reinforce the dressing to apply more pressure and notify the surgeon. So when the first dressing is removed by the surgeon, yeah, you need to do daily cleaning and, the dra and then dress the wound under aseptic techniques to prevent wound contamination and infection. You need also to administer prescribed prophylactic antibiotics to prevent infection. Apart from that, you can also uh, empty the, uh, the collecting drain bag the drainage bag regularly and then also record the color and as well as the amount and gently wash the skin around the incision or area daily with mild soap and water to prevent infection. You can also keep the dressing dry and clean to prevent contamination of the incision site. So all those points you can add them on wound care. From there you even now move on to exercise and ambulation which is also cardinal in managing a post-operative patient. So here you can talk about uh, points such as in the immediate post-operative care, uh, care or period, the patient will be on complete bed rest to in, enable the patient rest from the stress of surgery and recover from the effects of anesthesia. You can also perform passive exercises during this period uh, to improve uh, blood supply and prevent muscle wasting. So when vital signs are stable the, uh, uh, and the general condition of the patient is satisfactory, you can encourage the patient to start doing deep breathing as well as coughing exercises to prevent respiratory complications. Apart from that, you can also encourage the patient to move out of bed and walk around the blood, uh, around the ward and as well as performing limb exercises. So early ambulation here helps uh, blood circulation return to normal as well as decreasing the risks of blood clot formation in deep veins as well as helping bowel functioning normally and also lowering the risk of lung infections. Then from there you can now move on to hygiene. So on hygiene we can say uh, you can uh, talk about attending to the patient's personal as well as environmental hygiene needs as necessary according to the patient's condition. So this can include bathing the patient to promote patient's comfort and, remove, uh, and removing bacteria from the body that can have access to the open wound. Uh, oral care can be done to promote uh, or uh, in other words to stimulate salivary glands as well as comfort uh, as well as for comfort when the patient is still new per oral. Then apart from that you can also remove sword linen to reduce chances of infection as well as development of pressure sores and also promoting patient's comfort. Then the last heading for post-operative is going to be elimination. So at this point, you need to monitor the patient's eliminatory pattern to detect any abnormalities such as reduced urine output, diarrhea, or constipation. A patient who is adequately hydrated will void immediately between six to eight hours after surgery, and the total urine output will be lower than the fluid intake initially and usually because of the body fluid lost uh, during the surgical procedure and due to vomiting as well as fluid retention. So that restriction uh, uh, before and after surgery can be responsible for causing constipation. If there's constipation, you need to encourage adequate fluid intake and increased uh, dietary fiber. So those are some of the points you put on elimination and this is how you 
you, you, you explain the outline of post-operative, the points will be the same and they will never change. And this outline should not be mumbo jumbo. The way the outline is, it should be maintained because if you mumbo jumbo it, you distort the management and you won't get the correct marks. So this is where I'll end in today's presentation. Till next time, thank you so much for taking time to go through this uh, tutorial.